Okay, welcome. Let us start. I'm very pleased to welcome you to tonight's event. I am Volker Hessel, Deputy Dean of Research in the Faculty of Engineering, Computer and Mathematical Sciences, and I will be your Master of Ceremony tonight. A couple of points uh, of housekeeping before we begin. First, if you, need, um, if you are in need of the bathrooms, you will find them in the foyer area of this building over there. Uh, and uh, if we all need to evacuate, which I do not hope, uh, please follow the directions of our staff to the exits in the, the theater. We acknowledge and pay our respects to the Ghana people, the traditional custodians whose ancestral lands we gather on. We acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and relationship of the Ghana people to country and we respect and value their past, present and ongoing connection to the land and cultural beliefs. I'm pleased to let you know that this seminar will be live streamed worldwide so that we are globally connected. And if you want to be in the camera, it's over there. <laughs> so um, I, would uh, I would now like to introduce Anton Middelberg, uh, the executive dean of, our, of the Faculty of Engineering, Computer and Mathematical Sciences, and to formally introduce the event. And this will be followed by Mr. Stephen Patterson, member of parliament, the member for Morford, who will open then the event after Anton. So. Thank you, Volker, and uh, I'd like to welcome everyone. I'm very pleased to be uh, opening this event or introducing today's event. Uh, Improving Life on Earth in Space is the first seminar in our new Dean Seminar Series for the faculty, uh, People Who Change the World. I'd like to thank uh, Jaina Studemeyer for being here, uh, coming all this way, and agreeing to be our inaugural speaker. I can't think of someone uh, more likely to change the world at the moment, so thank you for coming. Um, our faculty uh, deputy dean, Volker Hessel, will tell us more about uh, Jana's amazing achievements shortly. Um, Adelaide University has been leading in space research for more than 50 years. In November 1967, Australia ended the space race by becoming only the third nation in the world to launch a satellite into space from its own country. That satellite, called RESAT, uh, was built at DST up here in Adelaide and was launched from Woomera on a redstone rocket given to us by the US. The experiments on board that satellite were designed by the University of Adelaide. Then the first Australian NASA or astronaut to go into space was Dr Andy Thomas, AO, a graduate of the University of Adelaide in mechanical engineering, BE and PhD. Um, as a student at this university quite some time ago, I remember uh, being told Andy was flying overhead and I remember him uh, posting, or not posting at that time, but uh, on the news, basically talking about looking down and seeing Adelaide um, on a cloudless night. In 2017, University of Adelaide again went into space. This time a CubeSat about the size of a shoebox was launched by NASA. That satellite was built by a team of around 50 University of Adelaide students and staff, led by people including Dr Matt Tetlau. Matt is now the CEO of the satellite startup Innovar. They are working with CSIRO now to build another CubeSat that they hope to launch next year. So lots happening. Um, interestingly, it doesn't just relate to microelectronics and rockets. Last month, researchers from this university's Institute of Machine Learning won the International Pose Estimation Challenge. Now I confess, I did not know what a Pose Estimation Challenge is when I heard the news. Uh, but when I went and Googled it, as you do, um, I discovered it's uh, an international competition organised by the European Space Agency and Stanford University. And what they do is they have a number of uh, images of a known uh, satellite and then, or spacecraft, and then the challenge is to estimate the relative position of that uh, in three dimensions from those images. Um, University of Adelaide won that uh, global challenge. We're now starting to turn our focus to applying our expertise in mining, exploration, construction, materials and energy to meet the challenge of finding a sustainable way to find and use resources in space. This is quite important. To lift something up to space costs about a million dollars a tonne in round numbers. We talk round numbers once you get to millions. It's about a million dollars a tonne. So the whole economics of sustainability, reuse, recycling, automation take on a different uh, socio-economic and technico-economic uh, framework up in space. As a part of that, we're also going to reimagining mining. 
and try and capture the next generation of students and to train a whole new generation of engineers with different skill sets. Lessons learned in space will have a direct impact down here on improving the sustainability of our own use of resources on the planet and will be a key, I think, to achieving social and economic goals for our state. We're actively also exploring space medicine technologies with partners such as Space Tango. University of Adelaide is a key partner down in Biomed City on the west end of North Terrace, where we also have Australia's most technologically advanced hospital and newest hospital. We think these technologies will enable local startups to build and service in space manufacturing platforms. We're also actively engaged with the Australian Space Agency to make sure that our world-class research strengths is aligned with the strategic imperatives on the Space Agency. We have a key opportunity and imperative in this state to continue to grow opportunities linked to the space industry. So it's very fitting that this inaugural lecture is related to space. I'd now like to hand back to Volker to introduce our guest of honour, who I hear is a former Victorian footballer. <laughs> Thank you, Anton. I would, like, uh, I would now like uh, to ask Mr. Stephen Patterson, Member of Parliament, Member for Morfitt, to open the event. Previously, Stephen was Major of Holdfast Bay Council, Electrical Engineer and Graduate of our Electrical and uh, Electronic School and former AFL player. Stephen particularly stands up for local community engagement and is an active patrolling member of the Glen Elk Surf Life Saving Club. He loves living in Glen Elk with his wife and four children and has great relationships with the locals. His credo is commitment, effectiveness, resi resilience and work ethic, which he learned to be successful first when he was playing in the elite team sport in AFL in Collingwood. He founded a company called Expert Technology, which develops sport membership and ticketing software for sporting clubs, including Melbourne City and the Sunshine Coast Lightning. So, please, Stephen. Well, thank you very much, Volker. And I'd just like to start by acknowledging that the land we meet on today is the traditional lands of the Ghana people and we respect their spiritual relationship with country. And we also pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Well, thank you very much and good evening, everyone. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm certainly delighted to be here tonight to participate in tonight's seminar about improving life on Earth via space. South Australia certainly has a proud history uh, in the area of space. Uh, from the late 1950s, the weapons research establishment commenced its Skylark sounding program at the Woomera rocket range. And, and certainly this led to Woomera becoming the hub of early space activities here in Australia, including the launch in November 1967 of the Weapons Research Establishment Satellite, or RESAT. And as Anton said, uh, Adelaide University certainly did play a significant role uh, as RESAT scientific instrument package uh, was derived uh, from the Australian Upper Atmosphere Sounding Rocket programs and this instrument package was designed, uh, set up and built in the space simulation chamber in the physics department building which is here in Adelaide on uh, North Terrace here. And in addition to that and that, that exciting development from the Australian point of view, uh, this year also marks the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 uh, lunar missions and also the moon walk and certainly there Australia also has um, a deep involvement. Uh, space tracking stations which was all at the Parkes Radio Telescope and also at Honeysuckle Creek Station tracking station played a vital role in supporting uh, the establishment of that mission and also receiving the first televised images of Neil Armstrong stepping on to the lunar surface. So these, these aspects of Australia's space activities were very important and as a young, a young student it certainly gave me an interest in space and out of this interest was one of the main reasons why, as Volker said, I studied electrical engineering here at Adelaide University. Um, and one of my focuses was on space at the time. So it's fantastic that 50 years uh, later after the moon landing that South Australia is again leading the way in space. South Australia is home to an innovative space ecosystem which consists of over 70 private companies, research and educational institutions and government departments and as well as employing over 800 people who are actively employed in this sector. 
As an example, in the past two years alone, over $61 million of investment has been committed to South Australia's space industry uh, through venture capital, uh, universities, local industry and government. And really, it's worth understanding what forces are driving some of this investment. As an example, uh, when I did some um, work as an intern at British Aerospace while I was at university, and I was really excited to work in the space industry. I thought it'd be, you know, at the cutting edge of technology. And, and what I soon found was that because of the expense involved in sending satellites up into space, a lot of the technology uh, that was used in those satellites was uh, had to be tried and tested and is actually, you know, between five and, and ten years old. Um, an example even now is uh, with the National Broadband Network, uh, the Sky Muster satellite uh, cost $500 million for each of those two satellites and, and weighed 6.4 tonnes and took five years to build and, and operate and put into that high space orbit. And, and because of this, these expensive satellites really became the game of either government or really big business. But compare this to what's happening now where satellites are really going the same way as computers uh, with miniaturisation of electronics uh, allowing instrumentation to be compacted uh, into these satellites that are the size of shoeboxes and Anton says that here just in 2017 the university was instrumental in putting up a nano satellite there and, and they just weigh in the order of kilograms. And so these satellites that are going up there's fantastic opportunities because of that. Uh, they're creating the next internet and they're certainly opening up commercial opportunities opportunities uh, such as the significant potential of being able to be used in agriculture uh, via the connection of Internet of Things uh, to benefit farmers for example and how they deliver food um, to us here in cities and, and how we go about life. So these, this aspect of miniaturisation is really what's fueling growth in the space industry certainly here in South Australia and it's seen, seen that growth uh, over the last number of years. In terms of the dynamic space industry that is uh, starting to um, develop here in South Australia, it is underpinned uh, by an advanced manufacturing and technology skills base that has strong synergies to our defence industries as well. So both these defence and space industries are supported by world-class research from universities here such as Adelaide University uh, to help with this development of these capabilities. And really this uh, capacity that we have here in South Australia, along with our vibrant and entrepreneurial space ecosystem, has meant that South Australia is now playing a crucial role in Australia's space economy uh, by contributing to the national space infrastructure with some significant investments. Uh, certainly I was very excited to be present at Lot 14 last year in December when the Prime Minister Scott Morrison and also the Premier Stephen Marshall announced the National Space Agency was going to be uh, based here in Adelaide. Uh, and that announcement really excited not only the participants there that, but a number, of, uh, a number of school children as well. I was at a, um, a graduation ceremony for one of the primary schools in my local electorate and just the mention of that on that night uh, caused uh, applause from all the parents as well because they really saw a future for this industry for their children. You could see also the excitement in terms of the children and, and them wanting to be involved in it as well. In terms of the National Space Agency and what its aims are, it's, it's aiming to use science, technology, engineering and maths to help design new solutions in the area of space operations, uh, space science and along with earth tracking, positioning and observation. And it aims to grow the space industry in Australia to 12 billion and create uh, 20,000 jobs. So establishing this agency certainly is a once in a lifetime opportunity uh, that will position South Australia as a key player in the nation's space industry. In addition to this, uh, there's also been the announcement of a mission control centre that will be co-located with the National Space Agency here in Adelaide and it'll be a focal point for space missions here in Australia. The facility itself will provide um, facilities for space startups, companies and research, research organisations to control small satellite missions and will enable real-time control and testing, but also the accelerated development of Australian uh, satellite technology here based in South Australia. And I think what's also a very significant um, advancement here in the space industry in South Australia has also been the fact that the SmartSat Cooperative Research Centre uh, will be uh, centred here in Adelaide as well. It really is a significant uh, event for South Australia and will be really uh, become a powerhouse, a research powerhouse that will bring together over 85 international and national partners um, who have all invested up to $190 million and include the Adelaide University as well. 
and together with a $55 million federal government support, it will re represent $245 million of research effort over the next seven years. It will be headquartered at Lot 14 and it will certainly un aim to unite government, industry and also researchers to build upon our ex existing space capabilities across smart satellites, communications and Earth observation analytics. So not only will this help boost our growing space industry, but it will certainly help boost a sovereign space and satellite capability here in Australia and really position our nation as a leader in what is a $383 billion global space sector, which of course continues to grow because each time I go, go to various uh, meetings, that figure seems to grow um, month by month. So it's really an exciting industry to be involved in and um, the, CRC, the SmartSat CRC really um, could be a real focal point in terms of providing more research into South Australia. I mean, some of the, the examples that potentially we can look at is to develop our sovereign capability, even from a GPS point of view, so we're not reliant upon other countries. And certainly there's interest, uh, we've just heard the announcement from the European Space Agency as well, uh, how they're looking to collaborate uh, with our Australian space industry and, and provide conduit for these industries and these companies that are growing here in Adelaide to have access to that European market as well. So that's certainly an exciting development here, right here in South Australia. So this space technology, it really has the potential to unlock new markets, as I explained, and future growth opportunities for industries, uh, such as agriculture, but also allowing other industries, such as mining uh, and construction and defence. And so certainly Anton's mentioned that the mining that is possible here in Adelaide University has one of the um, highest ranked mining schools throughout the whole world. And so again, South Australia, through that collaboration, can really forge a, a significant opportunity for local industries here in South Australia. In fact, it's estimated that around 1.5 million Australian companies could benefit from space technology via these sort of um, means that I've described earlier. So hopefully, and looking forward to uh, connecting all these providers of space technology with these everyday companies and businesses and then working together to lead some real solutions that will help improve our lives on Earth. Now, of course, I've spent a bit of time talking about satellites and that has been a significant focus certainly in, in this state over the last number of years. But as Anton mentioned, there's certainly other possibilities uh, for, for business growth uh, in South Australia, in Australia, that Adelaide University is looking uh, to collaborate with and I'm looking forward Yana, to hearing those sort of opportunities and learning how we can improve life on Earth via space. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, I'm very pleased to introduce Jana Staudemeyer as our speaker this evening. As, a, uh, as Anton said, the motto is people who change the world, but actually it's wrong, people who change the world. <laughs> we are still doing that and we expect a lot. So Jana received her master degree in biology at Harvard University. Then she had director roles at companies such as Advanced Tissue Sciences, MyCell Technologies and Brain Cells. So these are all very obviously biotechnology companies. Thereafter, she uh, was assigned vice president of Porta Novelli. Uh, where she worked with uh, leading innovators in healthcare like Johnson & Johnson Janssen and Eticon divisions. Then Jana moved into space with her role as commercial innovation uh, life sciences lead at the center of the advancements of science in space, which are managers of the US National Laboratory of the International Space Station. Thereafter and ongoing until now, Jana became the commercial innovation officer at Space Tango. That company is privately held space company and is NASA's first choice provider of small space laboratories for medicine and bioresearch at the International Space Station. She identifies biomedical research projects, we will hear about this, that will fly on future missions to the ISS, focused on the advancing understanding of uh, diseases, processes and treatment for significant global health burdens such as cancer, cardiovascular and metabolic disease along with regenerative um, medicine initiatives to help the organ shortage. Jana is also defining the emerging market, a new commercial enterprise of biomedical manufacturing in space. She has a strong understanding of the needs of a regulated industry and she has successfully commercialized the first FDA approved human tissue engineered skin product. So I think we're all now very keen, Jana, to hear your talk. Excellent.
Thank you very much, and it's wonderful to have the opportunity to be here with all of you tonight. Um, I appreciate all of the gracious time from everyone at the university and all of you coming tonight to hear a little bit more about the work that we're doing in microgravity. Um, we had the opportunity today to also go to Hamilton College, which was fantastic to actually see a Mars simulation in progress with students that were dressed as astronauts and at their control centers and really immersing themselves in an opportunity to understand what it's like to work on another planet. There's three things that I would like to leave you with through my talk tonight. One is sort of a broad vision of where we're going in terms of space and what happens with long duration missions. The second is to think a little bit about some of the opportunities to expand into markets beyond things like satellites. And a little bit of about the work that we're doing in low Earth orbit, which you'll hear referred to as LEO commercialization activities. And also to talk a little bit about the opportunities that we have with the innovation that is alive and well, and I have seen in the last day and a half while I've been here at the University of Adelaide to contribute to growing some of those additional market sites. So just to start out, as everybody knows, the Apollo 50th anniversary just happened, and I actually should tell you a little bit of a backstory here because the SpaceX 18 launch from Kennedy Space Center, which is a commercial resupply mission, which is where we fly most of our payloads right now, actually was scheduled to launch on July 21st. And as most of you know, July 20th was the actual anniversary. And so there was a satellite launch that was supposed to happen on the 19th. There was crew that was launching from Russia on the 20th, and then our mission was supposed to go up on the 21st. So we had all of our researchers in the labs and trying to focus on getting their payloads ready to get on the mission, but it was a little bit distracting because we had astronauts all over the place, and Mike Pence, our vice president, you know, came and in fact wanted to come into the laboratories to take a tour, and everyone said, no, we're working. You know, we can't close down for a security detail. Um, but we ended up having a fantastic experience and were able to really feel that 50th anniversary and think about where we're going. I mean, we're very close to being back on the moon, but one of the things that we all talked about is that in the last 50 years, it's not like we haven't been doing anything. We've been doing quite a bit. You heard a lot about what has happened here in Australia and how Australia has contributed in the last 50 years to the space economy. It was perfectly timed for my visit today that there was also an announcement of a new mineral that was found in an Australian asteroid. So there's lots that's happening and I think that sometimes that's not always appreciated and as we think about stepping back onto the moon, we certainly have a great opportunity to also reflect on the progress that we're making and the activities that are happening right now to build a new space economy. So as everybody knows, low Earth orbit and kind of ISS, the International Space Station, that's where we are today. Where we're headed is to the moon and eventually to Mars. So having an opportunity to think about by 2024, potentially having people on the moon using a lunar gateway to help to get us as the stepping stone onto Mars. These are all activities that are happening as we speak. The Artemis mission, which are the first moon missions that are, will be happening very soon. And just as a background here, I don't know if everyone is aware, but when the name for these missions was announced, we were all pretty happy because Artemis, if you don't know, is the twin sister of, of Apollo. And the idea in 2024 is that we'll have the next man and the first woman that will be landing on the moon. So there'll be a slingshot mission that will go, and then there will be a manned mission, and then eventually we are gonna be landing in 2024 and having an outpost on the south pole of the moon. The gateway, as I mentioned, is an opportunity for us to step from the moon onto Mars. So it's a long journey to get to Mars, about six months actually, um, although there's been some discussion about new fuels that are nuclear fuels that can maybe get us there in three to, three to four months. But it's a long trip. And basically when you go that far, you need to have a stopping point where you maybe can either refuel or potentially take a break because it's a long time to travel in a small space. Um, 
things that are being discussed right now, even in terms of Leo commercialization and how we're self-sustaining when we get to these planets, relate to things like the flow chemistry that we're talking to University of Adelaide about. They're going to be very important pieces for automated systems as well. We won't have hands on the lunar gateway. Sometimes it will be manned, but often it won't be. And when we go on the first moon missions, we will have no crew on those missions. The configuration of the gateway is also an international partnership. And it's something that everyone is eager to participate in. It took a collaborative effort to be able to build the International Space Station. Many countries had to come together to do that. Many countries are going to come together again to build the gateway. And when we think about the LEO commercialization efforts that are happening 250 miles up, those are going to be international efforts as well. They may not always be quite as visible as some of the platforms that are being built, but the success of building a commercial market in low Earth orbit, which really will expand the definition of global, you won't think so much just on the planet anymore, but 250 miles up, is going to happen between countries cooperating as well. When we get to Mars, we actually have some groups that are already designing habitats for where we might be able to live and how we might be able to 3D print them. These are actually designs that were just selected through a NASA Centennial Challenge for 3D printing of habitats on Mars. And you might have transportation as well when you get there. So there's a car that's floating out there, as you all probably know. And you know the, the sort of backstory on the car going up. I was talking to someone the other day. Everybody thinks that SpaceX and Elon Musk is you know, a pretty interesting person and certainly maybe likes to promote Tesla as well. But the fairing, actually, for the Falcon Heavy was something that was offered as a space to the military as well as NASA, actually for free. And because it was the first launch that was happening, Everyone was a bit tentative about potentially putting a very expensive satellite or payload on there. And you can't really fly that rocket without having some type of a simulated payload. So it was either going to be a big piece of metal or a car. So that leaves us with some additional transportation opportunities when we get there. So to talk a little bit, that's the vision, but to talk a little bit about where we are. So the ISS, as you probably know, 250 miles above your head floats a national laboratory. Most people actually think of the International Space Station as something that's up there, but not necessarily a laboratory. And when the shuttle program in the United States actually ended, most people thought, so did space. The truth is, that's when the station was built and the laboratory was actually open for use. So since that time, in 2011, we've actually worked on the space station to conduct a variety of different types of experiments. And just for a little bit of background, the station is the size of about a football field, weighs about a million pounds. The US module is two-story, five-bedroom house kind of equivalent, but every space is used. So the walls, the ceiling, the floor, because obviously there is no orientation of up and down. So the space economy, low Earth orbit has been used primarily for satellites. When we think now about what the space economy looks like, we often think of it in terms of the defense work and what you heard about earlier, even in terms of the satellite work that's been done here from Australia. The market is predicted to be substantial, over a trillion dollars by 2024. The opportunities that we have for satellites still continue to grow. And they're something that will always be a part of what we're doing from a benefit to life on Earth as well. Communications, imagery, you probably saw Hurricane Dorian, which just hit in the United States and actually was directly aimed at Cape Canaveral. And we were all a little bit nervous. NASA was on a big watch to make sure that everything was OK. And luckily, it moved out a little bit. And everyone's fine there. And it downgraded. But those types of communication opportunities and even imagery are extremely important. But they only take advantage of one piece of the low Earth orbit environment. 
and that's the vantage point. We have a lot of satellites up there. There's so many that we're creating an industry right now for satellites that are not necessarily operational being removed because they are abundant. And of the debris that's up there, which is over 50,000 pieces of metal that are flying around, there's probably only about maybe 20,000 of those or 2,000 of those rather that are actually operational satellites. So we need to be conscious as we think about the satellite market, but that could drive a new industry as well. Mining, you've heard a lot about mining. Asteroid mining, using resources on other planets. These are all things that are gonna become extremely important. Chemistry is gonna be a foundation. It's gonna be as important as water because it's the way that we're gonna be able to be self-sustaining when we get to other planets. I often have people ask me, how are we gonna catch those asteroids? I'm not actually sure that I can answer that for you yet, but I do know that I've been at conferences where I've seen people that actually have sort of small pieces of fabric that are very resilient to actually attempt to do the job. In terms of where we're going with biomedical applications, even the World Economic Forum is looking at the opportunity to produce things like vaccines or even some more of the complex biological stem cell therapies or even immunotherapies and gene therapies that we're gonna be moving forward with here on the planet. So we have an opportunity to really build a space economy that's gonna look very different from what it looks like today. When you think about precedents and how things change, every time that there has been a major advancement like electricity, life changes dramatically. Microgravity is pretty much the same thing. When we really start to understand how to harness the power of microgravity to think about those physical changes and changes that happen to biological systems, it's gonna become very transformative in terms of a manufacturing environment. When you think about sort of the precedent of even the internet and sort of space, there's a lot of parallels there. I mean, you know, when it was first developed, it wasn't necessarily highly used. When people first started using it, they weren't exactly sure how to use it. Now we can't live without it. It's on our phones. It's everything that we do. We Google everything that we don't know. It's really changed the way that we live our lives. Microgravity is pretty much the same idea. So getting to space right now is also very accessible. This is something that I'm not sure that most people realize, but there are rockets that launch almost daily out of Kennedy Space Center and many other launch facilities around the world. The first time when I was working as part of the team that manages the National Lab, the first time I was in Florida, it was about 10.30 in the morning, and someone said, hey, let's go to lunch. And I thought, lunch? It's kind of early for lunch. And we walked out the door, and a Delta Heavy came up. And I thought, oh my goodness. I mean, I didn't even have, when I transitioned to the space industry, I really had no idea how active it actually is. We have multiple vehicles right now that take us into a microgravity environment. SpaceX, as everyone knows, has the Falcon 9 rocket, which is beautiful, and reusable, and lands back on the planet or on the water and is absolutely spectacular to see. If you ever get a chance to do it, I highly recommend it. The Antares rocket is from Northrop Grumman, used to be owned by Orbital ATK. That launches out of Wallops, Virginia, and is another opportunity for commercial resupply missions. There's also a company called Rocket Labs that is in New Zealand. You may have heard of Rocket Labs. They actually just purchased some launch pads in Wallops, Virginia, and will be launching out of the US as well. And then companies like Blue Origin, who right now are doing suborbital flight, but are looking to potentially also do a moon landing and go further into space as well. Those are some of the rockets. There's also some other transportation opportunities that are coming into the picture and will be here very soon, as well as other vehicles. So on the top left-hand side of that slide, that's the Axiom Private Space Station. So right now there is a group that is actually and the person leading it is the person who worked at NASA previously and actually built the International Space Station. And he moved out into private industry and is actually now designing a private space station. It's potentially 
will dock to the International Space Station to begin with, but eventually will be a free floater. In the middle is the Sierra Nevada Dream Chaser. This is another vehicle that's going to act very much like the shuttle. So it will launch on a rocket, but it will land back down on a runway. It's going to give us additional capacity for commercial resupply and to carry commercial crew. The Boeing Starliner capsule and the SpaceX capsule are also commercial crew vehicles. We're super excited. Before we go to the moon, we're likely going to be launching astronauts again from US soil. That's actually a very near term, hopefully end of this year, early next year. We'll actually be launching from US soil as well. And then companies like Bigelow Aerospace that are also designing habitats that will be permanently placed on orbit as well. So the current vantage point of the space economy is what we use now, but where we're going in harnessing that power of microgravity that's 250 miles overhead is really to look at technology and biomedical products, opportunities to do research as well as manufacturing. So you might ask why, like what is different in microgravity and why would you want to do this? And your points about the economic case, you know, they're well taken because you do need to think about the cost of going to space and why you might want to do it. But there are major changes that happen in terms of fluid, surface tension, shear forces, even convection. Heat doesn't rise, so a flame is not yellow and long, it's round and blue. Buoyancy, when you boil things in space, the bubbles don't rise, they stay at the bottom. So, and sedimentation is an amazing piece of technology application. We'll talk a little bit more later about optical fiber manufacturing that relies very much on the fact that sedimentation doesn't exist in microgravity. But all of these changes that take place in physical properties really give us an opportunity to think about new ways to manufacture. Same is true for biological systems. In microgravity, you have changes in the way that cells aggregate, the way that they signal. Gene expression is completely different. You get to see things in a way pathogens are sometimes more virulent. The station is also a model for accelerated aging, so we have the opportunity to look at things like bone density, muscle wasting, immune response, cardiovascular response in astronauts, we know that all of those things change. We can start to understand those changes at a cellular level that might also tell us about disease and potential interventions. Protein crystallization is another area for the pharma industry that is a significant area in terms of drug discovery, being able to see those protein crystals form in a way that they're larger because there is no sedimentation, so they actually can assemble in a different format, gives opportunities to find new drug targets as well. So when you think about the economics of the space economy, this is a slide that represents what the satellite market currently looks like. As you can see from this slide, it's robust. It is extremely well funded by both commercial and defense and government agencies. What we're hoping from a NASA commercialization standpoint is that we start to see a little bit more of an opening, as you can see in that sort of yellow space, that will relate to commercial applications that are beyond the satellite market. NASA recently announced at NASDAQ that they are going to be allocating 5% of their resources towards commercial projects. They're also being very generous in terms of trying to subsidize what those launch costs per kilo are going to look like. We're not going to have that opportunity forever, but we have it now. So it's a great opportunity along with the commercial resupply missions, which again, NASA supports research payloads flying on those rockets at no cost at the moment. So we don't have to pay for the rocket just yet, and it's a great time for us to be able to learn. There are several companies as well that are writing commercialization reports, trying to address the economics of that market development and why we want to do it. People talk about space tourism, but they also talk about manufacturing because when you identify properties that you cannot necessarily achieve here on Earth, those are the types of manufacturing opportunities that give you economic advantage. And so we're not in the research model. We're looking to understand processes, 
how can we translate that back to terrestrial benefit? In the manufacturing model, we're looking for the things you can't do here on Earth that, be, that potentially can help us to build that market. A little bit about what we're currently doing right now from a Space Tango perspective. So we're a small company that's uh, been around for a few years, but is relatively new to the space industry as well. We design, build, and operate facilities on the International Space Station. Just to give you a, a little bit of background, our headquarters are in Kentucky, which is not traditional in terms of the space industry. Most people think Florida or Houston. Um, our engineers who actually started the company and are fantastic are out of the University of Kentucky. And so they really wanted to establish a space foothold in Kentucky. We also have additional facilities in Houston. We have an operations console, and we have facilities at Kennedy Space Center and Wallops Island that we prepare our payloads. OK? No presentation about space is complete without a rocket launch. Three, two, one, lift off. We have a lift off. Roger roll, Houston. So this will give you a, just a quick look at one of our facilities on station, and the astronaut here is installing one of our Cube Lab facilities. Just briefly, to show you a little bit about the process that we use to get to those facilities on ISS. So as I mentioned, SpaceX rockets and Antares rockets, those are the commercial resupply flights for NASA right now. That's where our payloads will actually fly. A little bit on um, rockets for anybody who may not know. The Falcon 9 rocket, as I mentioned before, actually does reland, so it's a, usable, a reusable rocket. The Dragon capsule that sits on top of the Falcon 9 rocket is the only capsule that re-enters. The Cygnus capsule that sits on top of the Antares rocket is actually designed to be the trash vehicle. So on station, they obviously have to get rid of their waste as well, and they don't really have trash pickup, so they have to put all of the trash into the Cygnus capsule, and that burns up on re-entry. On the far right-hand side of this slide, I just wanted to give you a sense. We're not always able to get pictures inside the Dragon capsule, but inside the Cygnus capsule, that's what it looks like when the payloads are all stacked up and ready to go. We dock outside the station. You Here you can see this was the Dragon capsule that was docked to the station on SpaceX 18 that recently just flew. This is a good example also of how busy it really is in space. We often talk about rate limiters for new payloads going up are the sort of parking spaces at station. And here you can see there's several vehicles that are docked to station at one time. That's not unusual. I mean, there's always a Soyuz capsule that's up there. That's their emergency egress vehicle and is used to boost the station if it needs to boost into a higher orbit. Um, but we often have multiple vehicles at station at one time. As I mentioned before, every piece of the station is used. So space is pretty limited, as you can see here, by sort of all of the walls, floor, ceiling, everything being really a floating laboratory. Here's a picture of the Tango Lab facilities that are on orbit right now. So we have two of them that are in the US Destiny module on the station. We actually did an experiment not too long ago where we took one of those modules and we unbolted it from the station and put it into a Cygnus vehicle that was docked on station to show that we could extend the lab. There's often need for additional space and to be able to show that we could portably move our facility with sort of a very long extension cord to have some power out to it, but into a vehicle that was docked on station means we have opportunities to really expand the amount of research that we can do. We've also built a power descent utility locker, which allows us to control on ascent, payload, power, media changes, temperature, things that we might want to control on the way up on ascent. So the way that we basically work is we build an engineer, an automated system that allows you to support 
research across a variety of applications, technology and biomedical. And our engineers are quite skilled in precision engineering, microfluidics, all kinds of opportunities for us to be able to really develop systems on a very small scale that are extremely precise from a space engineering perspective. We have a variety of different sizes of systems that we put together, and then we launch them on rockets and put them into the facilities on orbit so that we can control them from the ground. The far left, you see the payload cards, and in the middle, the astronauts kind of holding up the cube labs that are attached to those payload cards. What I showed in that video was actually the insertion of one of those payload cards into the Tango Lab facility, and then we have a console both in Kentucky and also in Houston where we're talking to the astronauts, also looking at our payloads once they're installed and commanding them from the ground. To date, since 2017, when we launched our first commercial payloads, we've participated in 13 missions, 79 payloads, and 131 experiments that we've conducted. That's a bit of a record for our, even our own industry and our own company, and it's been fantastic to see the amount of enthusiasm that we've had from commercial companies to really come along with us to help to develop these markets. That's why we're very excited to have the opportunity to be talking beyond the US and sort of internationally with how we can involve others in this same effort. Here's a little bit on some of the different types of payloads that we support on station. So we've done quite a bit of work in plant growth, not necessarily for growing plants on other planets, but basically to look at crops and efficiency of nutrient uptake, drought resistance. This happens to be a payload that was sponsored by Anheuser-Busch, um, a Budweiser payload looking at barley. They have sort of announced that they want to be the first beer on Mars. I'm not sure when I get to Mars that I'm going to be thrilled to have a Budweiser, but you know, at the end of the day, um, it's a great initiative and it's one that we were very happy to help them to support. They're using the research that they're doing right now terrestrially to look at if, how they can increase their crop production here on the ground. We're also doing a fermentation process and a malting process with them as well to take the process a little bit further. Tissue chips, when we were talking about the regenerative medicine applications, so there's a program that has been put in place as a collaboration between the National Institutes of Health and NASA and the ISS National Lab, where we're looking at not only using station as an accelerated model for aging, but also leveraging that precision engineering from aerospace teams to help to advance tissue chip technology. You may be familiar with the tissue chips that are being used now to kind of replace animal testing, as well as for personalized medicine applications. Um, we have several of the payloads that we've flown that are mimicking blood-brain barrier, bone marrow and lung, gut. Um, there are chips that are flying up there as well that look at kidney. Um, one of them was an accelerated model for looking at kidney st stone formation. But one of the fun parts for us is not only the science that we can understand better in terms of those biological processes and think about how we can build models that can be used for personalized medicine applications, but the engineering is so precise that it gives significant advantages to the size of those automated systems. In the bottom left-hand corner, the team that we work with on the blood-brain barrier chip is a team called Emulate. And they are fantastic, and their white box on the bottom is called a Zoe. In that small box, there's one tissue chip that they can process in an automated way. In the small silver box right next to it, there's actually six chips that we sent to space. So we were able to take the engineering to a whole new level, and they affectionately refer to that as the cosmic Zoe, which is fantastic. On SpaceX 18, we just sent two brain organoid payloads. Again, looking at the development of models that can help us to understand both neurodegenerative and neurodevelopmental diseases. One payload was actually looking at Parkinson's and MS and the neural inflammation pathway that is common to both of those diseases. The other payload was looking more from an autism spectrum perspective, 
Are there biomarkers or developmental factors that we might be able to see in these models that can help us to better understand those diseases and potentially give us opportunities for treatment? The Parkinson's and MS payload was actually patient cells. So it's the first time that any patient cells from patients with Parkinson's or MS have actually flown in microgravity. It's the start of the personalized medicine applications. Flow chemistry. So we conducted a liquid-liquid separation. I mentioned earlier that surface tension is a very strong force in microgravity. So being able to demonstrate a first step in a flow chemistry process, the fact that we could do a separation on orbit was a very important concept for us. We're moving now into the area of looking at peptide coupling, UV and thermal reactions, which are the basis of some of the flow chemistry, continuous API, and mining applications that we're talking to University of Adelaide about. So when you think about the research and moving that research to a manufacturing opportunity, we see sort of three areas where we potentially can move towards manufacturing. One is materials, the second is layer deposition, and the third really are the biologics. Really, it's the complexity across these different sort of sectors that we're looking at. When we're making things that are more materials related, they're straightforward in the sense that they give us an opportunity to leverage some of those physical properties, but do it in a way that we don't have the same constraints as maybe more sensitive biological systems that require temperature control, CO2, sort of fine maintenance. And in the middle, the layer deposition, that's a crossover category that actually gives us opportunities to think about things like retinal implants, as well as semiconductor type applications, photovoltaics, all kinds of different technology applications that are a little more complicated than a straightforward materials payload, but a little less complicated than some of the biologics. The thing that is most complex about the biologics payloads as well is that we intend to develop a manufacturing process on orbit that will allow us to be able to have FDA approved products. So those intended for human use. That's something that currently does not exist on orbit. So when you hear people talking about how they're gonna do things on orbit and manufacture biomedical products and cure cancer and they can't do it without having that process in place. And it's a very difficult process on the ground, but we intend to develop that on orbit as well. The next two slides are examples of payloads where we've actually moved from research to pilot scale manufacturing. So the first is a, it fits, fits into that materials sector that we were talking about. It's a fiber optics payload where we actually, on orbit, extruded fiber that was optically pure. So since you don't have sedimentation issues in microgravity and everything sort of stays in suspension, plus you don't have any convection, so you have sort of a, it's a heatless process, you can spool fiber very quickly. The economic case for this has been really easy to make because if we talk about how we move data around right now, as we were saying earlier, the internet is the way we live our lives and there's just more and more data that is gonna need to be moved around as we continue to use that type of technology. This improves the data tr transmission rates by about 100%. So when you can have a fiber that you can manufacture on orbit and bring back down the cost of even the rocket launch being included becomes very manageable. The retinal implant payload is one in the category of that layer deposition. It's a nice project for us as well because it's a crossover. It actually gives us the opportunity to step into that products intended for human use biologics category, but not all the way into the cell-based applications, which are a little bit more complex. This payload, we actually flew on SpaceX 16. It, was, it came out of a mass challenge competition, so a pitch competition, where companies got together and talked about their opportunities and ideas for why they might want to manufacture in space. This is a protein polymer combination. 
in microgravity, the ability to layer in a more uniform and perfect way is something that you can't achieve on the ground. And this is used for patients with retinitis pigmentosa or macular degeneration. So from a vision perspective, it's extremely important that it's as uniform and consistent as it can possibly be. We're super excited that after the first results of this payload, we actually, NASA has granted a small business research and innovation grant to this company and is also supporting to help us to build capabilities for future manufacturing. So biologics, the next area that we would kind of like to look at, vaccine production, not in the sense of flu vaccine, but more complex vaccines that are made out of DNA, lipids, and excipients, immunotherapies, kind of the personalized medicine approach for vaccines and immunotherapies that you see out there. We'd also like to look at maybe some recombinant protein, monoclonal antibodies. These are all areas that we would like to continue to explore. Flow chemistry is also another area. From the perspective of the flexibility of that process and the importance of not only the chemistry but the automated systems to supporting those long duration missions, these are the types of applications that we see as significant in terms of building the market. And what we've been talking about in terms of the capabilities that are here, how can we look at those microreactor systems? How can we look at the communications that we might be able to develop for remote control of those payloads? The laboratories that would be developed as a space laboratory for manufacturing things like medicines or potentially mining of volatiles. And we are even open to discussing the opportunities to put propulsion systems in as well. So we may be able to do this in a CubeSat format initially, and then move that onto a platform that gives us the opportunity to think about more of a manufacturing application. From the vision perspective, I think this fits really nicely with where the Australian Space Agency and the university is thinking about how they can develop the capabilities for what comes next and how do we make Australia unique in the opportunity to contribute to the growth of the future space economy. Our pipeline, by 2024, we would like to have a fully automated platform. We're currently sort of in that phase two, three right now, where we're looking at applications, doing research, defining some of those early pilot stage opportunities for commercial manufacturing and building the market, and then moving on to a platform that is not gonna dock to anything, will be completely autonomous, and will allow us to have a little bit smaller diameter, so a thousand pounds, is a little smaller than the Dragon capsule, which carries about 5,000 pounds of cargo right now. But the idea would be that we would start from a small perspective, and as we need more capacity, we can build a little bit larger. The flexibility of having our own opportunity to be able to access microgravity and do it in a way where we can keep the cost substantially lower is a significant upside in terms of a new approach to how we would commercialize the market. And certainly from the perspective of a GMP rating, that's something that no one currently has right now. And we would like to put that in place. The opportunities to build the capsule are things that I don't want to say are easy, because nothing in space is ever easy. But capsules have been built for a long time. People know how to do that. What hasn't been done is putting those automated systems in place that can really support manufacturing. And automated systems that would give you the opportunity to also manufacture products that could be used by people. We really are at a point where we are returning to space. But this time, it's not just to put a footprint on the moon, it's to stay. And my hope is that we're gonna have an opportunity to continue these collaborations and have Australia right there with us as we build the new space economy. Thanks. Thank you very much, Anna. We have to come 250 miles down now, slow, <laughs> but slowly, otherwise it's destructive. Fair.
I don't want to extend now uh, this seminar forever because it's already quite long, but I would allow one, two questions from the audience. And we also will have one question from the world, which will be given. So maybe we start with the audience, really one, two question, and please give it. We have a lot of young people here. You, you will see that. We will not see that anymore. So please, a question. In, in the collaboration, um, you, you showed uh, the ESA and, and NASA and uh, some of the others. Um, do you see uh, that collaboration extending in a rich way to uh, Russia, China, India, um, and other emerging? Sure, that's a great question. In terms of other countries participating, I do think we're going to see other countries that are going to continue. It's been unclear how much the Russian group is going to be participating in the next round, but ESA, JAXA, they're at the table right now. So European Space Agency, Canadian Agency, Japanese Agency, um, China were actually prohibited from working with in the US. We have a congressional mandate that we cannot work with China, so they are working independently. Some groups like ESA are actually talking to China, and I think eventually you are going to see that there's going to be a little bit more collaboration there from a U.S. perspective as well. Now we will take a question from the internet. Vienna, do you have a question from the moon? <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to get an outsider's perspective of, of how Australia can contribute because we all know that we're very proud Australians and we love our technology and innovation. But from someone who hails from the US, what do you see in us? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm so thrilled to be here right now because I think that the timing is just perfect for the Australian Space Agency to be standing up and for everything that's happening on the front of commercialization and going to the moon. For Australia to step in and contribute with the technology that's here on things like chemistry, on opportunities for automation, right? There's a rich history of satellite work that's already been done. There's new areas where Australia, I think, can start to really shine as well in terms of the capabilities that are being built on orbit right now. And from a stars aligning, pun intended, you know, it's automated systems and chemistry, I think, are going to be two of the most important things that are going to drive not only the commercialization of low Earth orbit and the space economy expanding into those other sectors, because again, there's crossover to both biomedical applications with continuous API, as well as mining applications. And I think there will be tremendous benefit to the country just from what we learn in those initial research and commercial manufacturing opportunities that we're looking for, we may be able to think about mining or parts of a mining process that maybe are not as environmentally friendly being done on orbit, right? How we can change that paradigm of even what mining might look like, how we can change the paradigm of how we manufacture medicines. And using a flow chemistry approach is something that the pharma industry right now is very keen on. They understand that they have to change their processes. We know that there's going to be changes in microgravity that may make those processes very much more efficient. So I think there are a broad array of opportunities and the timing is so perfect with the expertise that's here for groups to come together. And as I mentioned, the market, the commercial market is not going to build itself. It's going to be an international effort, just like the space station and the gateway are an international effort. So Working collaboratively together, I think Australia can not only make a name for the work that can be done here, but can be a very important part of that space economy. Okay, last question, but really the last. <laughs> okay, I have a question. Who wants to go to the moon or Mars? <laughs> All right, nice, nice. I know, I would go. I mean, I definitely, in fact, I hope that at some point as they, one of the things that NASA announced with their commercialization plan was 
if you can afford $35,000 a night for your hotel room on the ISS, you can actually go up and do your own experiments. So they will train you for a couple of years and you could be an astronaut if you wanted to pay for it. So there's commercial opportunities as well. But I'm pleased to see that everybody came tonight. Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you.